Hello and welcome to HBO's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. Yes, I decided to go back to weekly. I'm going back weekly starting today. So, we've got a big show for you guys. I got a lot of stuff to talk about. So, let's get started. First, we want to talk about the Mokele Mbembe, the living dinosaurs people thought lived in the Congo. But this article says, yeah, we wish it was true, too. Now, this is apparently a drawing of Brontosaurus, but it may be what supposedly Makele Mbembe looks like and what it's supposed to be. Do sauropods live in the Congo? No, but that didn't stop the idea from circulating in the not-so-distant past. The dinosaur in question was said to be a long-necked, rotund, sauropod-like herbivore that waded through swamps and rivers. It's big in the cryptozoology circles, but its origins, like many cryptids, are murky. So it's not a it's not a brontosaurus. This is apparently some footage from 1992. Some scientists take the Bayaka story very seriously. In 1992, a Japanese expedition traveled to remote Black Tele, in the heart of the Congo forest. They were looking for a dinosaur, a long-lost leftover from the Cretaceous period. They even claimed to have seen and shot footage of a plesiosaur-like creature swimming in the waters of the lake. Mokele and Ben. Wait a second, a plesiosaur? Not a brontosaurus? Huh. Interesting. So, this article seems to be a bit skeptical of the possibilities of there being something like that living in the jungles of the Congo. So, I mean, Darren Nash discovered Supposedly, this was untrue. You know, I don't know. It, the thing is, there's all kinds of possibilities in this world. There's all kinds of mystery creatures running around. Could there possibly be some sort of dinosaur running around? in the Congo. Well, we don't know. That footage is quite interesting, I'll tell you that much. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. But for them to say it's a plesiosaur, not a brontosaurus? Could brontosaurus swim? I guess they could. I don't know, guys. I just don't know. I'm, I'm very puzzled. I, I mean, I've heard the legends of the Makele Mbembe for quite a few years now. I heard a podcast where John Kirk talked about going to the Congo to look for the Makele Mbembe. He never actually saw it, but he knows from the legends that the people talked about that there was some sort of living dinosaur there. So this is one of those cases where could it be, could it be. Now here's something fascinating: Bigfoot warnings in state park parks are hoax, according to a state agency. And this is in Pennsylvania, by the way. Uh, 
Apparently, poster is warning of Bigfoot sightings in some parks and calling for a heightened level of caution are a pure hoax being perpetuated by unknown actors, according to Wesley Robinson, press secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which administers state parks. These signs were not posted by DCNR, he said. We have seen them in parks for months, and they are removed when they are reported or found by staff because they have not been authorized. We have seen them in many parks, but I don't have a number for how many parks where the signs have been posted. He added, Bigfoot is not real. <laughs> okay, well, Bigfoot's not real, according to this guy. Okay, well, I guess we're all wasting our time then. I guess I guess we've been hallucinating. I guess all of us witnesses hallucinated what we saw then, didn't we? No. Huh. But still, I don't know. So apparently, no, these posters are not put up by the Pennsylvania DCNR. Okay, well, that means somebody with a lot of time and a print and on their hands and a printer were able to make something look official when it really wasn't. So it's printed on a fake DCNR letterhead. Okay. Well, there you go. And with AI being so prevalent these days, it's really difficult to pick out real from fake. Steve Coles recently exposed a hoax that was done by CGI of a supposed Sasquatch being filmed from a supposed doorbell camera. I do wish people would not hoax. Was what was one of the what is one of the, uh, what do you call it? One of the edicts from Thomas Steenberg, Thou shalt not hoax. And I agree with that. Now here's something interesting. Alberta Canada Trail Cam catches video of possible Bigfoot. That thing is 12 feet tall. A lot of times Bigfoot sightings are a matter of people not knowing what it is they are seeing in the woods. They may mistake the call of an elk or bobcat for the scream of a Sasquatch, or see a bear on two legs and imagine they are seeing a hairy humanoid. All right, there's a couple of deer. They're just standing there in front of a trail cam, a trail video cam. And supposedly a Sasquatch is going to show up. Supposedly. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, what's that? Is that an orb? Or 
or dust particle? I mean, what is it? This must be the item in question, or the, the, the individual in question. Could be. Very interesting. But when the person who claims they saw a Bigfoot is actually a forest ranger or other wildlife expert, I start to wonder if perhaps they know what they are talking about. These people are wilderness experts. Surely they are more... They are familiar with the calls of normal woodland creatures and have known a few bears who like to walk about on their hind legs. This is from 2020 from Alberta, Canada. When a wildlife biologist studying wolverines in the Canadian Rockies apparently caught sight of a Sasquatch lurking among the spruce. Oh goodness, I don't know. It's fascinating, it's interesting, but we all know that footage ain't going to do it. If the PG film didn't do it, modern footage isn't going to do it either. It isn't going to be convincing to the skeptics, because they'll just look at it and say, oh, that's fake, or that's shadows, or that's something else. It's a bear sitting on his hind legs, or it's a guy in a costume. Skeptics need more tangible proof. They need evidence. They need a skull on the table. Nothing else will be accepted. Short of that, it doesn't exist. That's what Gore Krantz said. Now, here is one of three articles I have here about the Patterson-Gimlin film. Apparently, it was profiled in a Hulu Sasquatch documentary which was actually really not so much about Sasquatch, the individual, but a guy whose nickname was Sasquatch. Supposedly a killer. The, the, the story was about cannabis farmers who were found ripped apart, supposedly. There were those who said it was actually done by a human, not a, not not a cryptozoological creature. I'll let you guys read the rest of this article, but the article is about the PG film, but it also describes briefly this documentary, which was on Hulu. It's been nearly 56 years. In fact, it'll be 56 years to the very day this year, October 20th. Now, this article is from 2017, but I want to point out at least one thing about this article, and that's this photo, or this composite, of three different footprint casts. One from China, one from 1967, nine days after the Patterson Gimlin film was taken, cast by Bob Titmus, and then a cast by Paul Freeman from 1991 in Washington State. They all have the same feature. The midfoot flexibility. Cliff Berkman is best known as a co host for Animal Plants Finding Bigfoot. As a professional Sasquatch researcher for more than two decades, he's seen a lot of fake Bigfoot prints, but he says the Patterson Gimlin ones aren't so easily dismissed. 
The trailing leg of the creature shows a great flexibility in the foot, Berkman said. There are a few frames there where we see Patty take her heel off the ground, but yet keep the entire forefoot in touch with the ground. Along with the footage of Patty were a clear track of prints that were captured by photo and later cast. These footprints exhibit the flexibility Berkman was explaining. It's a unique characteristic that Professor Meldrum has researched for years. One of the footprints showed a very distinct pressure ridge, a push-off that comes about as a result of a very flexible midfoot, he said. To him, this ridge is a smoking gun. He's seen that same unique feature in foot samples across decades and continents. So we have the one from China, cast in 1995. We have one from of course, the Patterson Gimlin film from 1967, and then we have the one from Washington State from Mill Creek from 1991. So we have quite a bit of congruency between three different footprints cast in three different areas, including one internationally. That's the thing I wanted to point out, is the fact that we have the same feature in three different footprint casts. Now, I have copies of both this cast and this cast, and they both have the same feature, the midfoot flexibility, the pressure ridge. Which is quite fascinating. And the possibility of these being hoaxed is practically impossible. Mainly because nobody really knew about this feature until 1999 when Jeff Miller started talking publicly about the midfoot pressure ridge. Before 1999, no one really knew about this feature. And who would know in China? And how would Paul Freeman know to hoax something like this? He wouldn't. So that indicates to me quite a bit of credibility in all three of them. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Did you ever dream of being a monster hunter? Well, a new search for mythical Loch Ness creature needs volunteers. The tourism group says it's running the largest search for Nessie in decades. Calling all monster hunters. The Loch Ness Center in Scotland looking for volunteers to join an effort to search for the infamous Loch Ness Monster. Putting out the call to help them put on the largest search since the 1970s, the tourist attraction also saying they plan to employ drones that will produce thermal images of the lake. The search for Nessie planned for August 26th and 27th. I started that off like it was a tease, but mm -hmm. no, gotcha. No, it's a tease. <laughs> that yes, was a Nessie exists. You yeah. could do search if you want. Do, do, do. Get to the bottom of it once and for all. <laughs> And there you go. Monster Hunters Assemble. Loch Ness Center announced it's set to begin the biggest search in over 50 years for the mythical creature known as Nessie. And volunteers are needed. It's dubbed the biggest of its kind search since the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau studied the lake in 1972. So if you're willing to move to Scotland for a few months, or maybe permanently, and you've got, let's say, endless cash resources, why not? Usually when they say volunteers, that means un unpaid. So <laughs> you're on your own when it comes to cash, I guess. Here is the third article of three about the Patterson Gimlin film. This is mainly about the footprint cast. This is one of the ones that Roger cast. 
on October 20th, not one of the Titmus casts. And these are just examples of the cast. Now I know Googs and Company, GoogsCo.com sells a copy of this cast. So does the site BigfootCasts.com. BigfootCasts.com also sells a copy of this cast. The one with the midfoot flexibility, which I showed you in the previous one of the previous articles. In other words, this cast. The one with the best foot flexibility. As you can see, there are some photos of these casts. Apparently, an individual named Scott McNabb got taken in. By a fake footprint, which was made by a Patterson Gimlin film cast. So I'm sure he's learned his lesson since then. Hopefully he has anyway. But I think footprint casts are very important and are an important part of the research and of the evidence for Sasquatch. Here's a nice obituary for Peter Byrne from the Tillamook Headlight Herald. You actually listen to this article. Let's listen to it. Peter Cyril Byrne, World War II veteran, conservationist, explorer, author. At age 97, Peter Byrne passed peacefully in Tillamook, Oregon on July 28, 2023. He was born August 22, 1925 in Dublin, Ireland. On the family estate, Peter was raised with three siblings. In 1943, he enlisted in the Royal Air Force and was stationed in the East Indian Ocean on the Copas Islands off of Australia where he served with distinction until the war ended. After the war, Peter became a tea planter in Northeast India. After a serendipitous encounter in Bombay, he became friends with the King of Nepal's brother and was granted property in Nepal where Peter conducted hunting safaris in the white grass plains of Western Nepal. After 18 years of big game hunting, in 1968 he turned to conservation in Nepal where he convinced the government to create a wildlife preserve and eventually established the Sukila Fontan National Park. He said, I showed them that taking a photograph of a rhinoceros was worth 1,000 times more than shooting it once. He also pioneered Nepal river rafting and trekking expeditions during his many lengthy trips to the country. During the Nepal years, Peter also established the nonprofit International Wildlife Conservation Society. In the interests of the society, he traveled globally and through his magnetic personality, established many friends and gained honors, among them a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society and membership in the Explorers Club of New York. But, spiritually, he was forever drawn to the Himalayas, with his last trip to Nepal thought to be in 2012. In Nepal, Peter was sought after by Texas oil man Tom Slick. Slick financed a two-year burnt Himalayan expedition to find the fabled Yeti. After few results were found of the Yeti, in 1960 Slick brought Peter to Northern California and the Pacific Northwest USA to track Bigfoot. That search unfortunately ended with Slick's sudden death in an airplane crash in 1962. Thereafter, Peter conducted two other, long and well-funded Northern Oregon Bigfoot projects. Again, with no physical evidence of Bigfoot, those projects ended in the late 1990s. Peter then moved to Los Angeles, but after never really feeling at home in the overcrowded city, he retired to a cabin on the banks of the Nestucca River in Pacific City, Oregon. In Pacific City, Peter continued to write the remainder of his 20 books. He also wandered the mountains of the coastal range with friends in his continuing quest for sightings of Bigfoot. Peter Cyril Byrne is survived by his daughter Rara Byrne now living in Perth, Australia, his sister Beryl Green of Maidenhead, England, and his life partner of more than 25 years, Kathy Griffin in Pacific City, Oregon who lives in the riverside cabin they shared. 
Remembrances, a journalism scholarship has been established in his honor, the Peter Byrne Endowed Scholarship Fund in Journalism for the Talent and Love of Writing. Please send checks or funds payable to the Nestucca High School, P.O. Box 38, Cloverdale, Oregon 97112. For the scheduling of a celebration of life for Peter, please see his website at peterkern.com. To plant a tree in memory of Peter Byrne as a living tribute, please visit Tribute Store. Actually, it's PeterCBurn.com. He said PeterBurn.com. It's actually PeterCBurn.com. I'll include the link to that website down below for you guys to check out. So, RIP Peter Burn. I don't have to go into, again, how I feel about Peter Byrne. I think he is one of the pioneers. As I already did a tribute video for him nearly three weeks ago on the day of his passing. So, there you go. Finally, let's talk about supposed Bigfoot hoaxes. This website, hoaxes.org. apparently thinks that everything is a hoax. All the Sasquatch sightings and accounts are hoaxes. Oh, supposedly the Battle of Ape Canyon was done by a YMCA summer camp who threw stones down a hill. There was no evidence supposedly found by a local game warden. And to be fair, there is no, of course, evidence that any of that ever actually happened to those miners. I what Fred Beck had, had said. But if that's the case, then how could he have perfectly described what we now know as the Sasquatch? I mean, yeah, there's no evidence other than his word. But how could he have perfectly described the, the actual description and the look of Sasquatch? just doesn't make any sense to me. And apparently Albert Osman's story stretches credibility too, supposedly. Yeah, he waited 33 years to tell it because he didn't want people to think he was nuts. I mean, some aspects of Osman's story may seem to stretch credibility, but it doesn't mean he, it, was, it didn't happen to him. But of course, again, we have no evidence that it happened. We do have evidence from the birth of Bigfoot, supposedly, well, supposedly the birth of Bigfoot from 1958. But we know that Sasquatch were around long before that. And descriptions of Sasquatch were around long before that. Apparently, this particular article takes the word of Ray Wallace. And it still claims that Ray Wallace made all those footprints in 1958. He may have made a few. He may have, but it doesn't mean he made all of them. He certainly didn't make the one that Jerry Crew found and cast. I don't believe he made that one. The late Bill Miller took a casting, or took a picture of a casting of the Jerry Crew footprint 
and made and, and several other footprint casts and made them all the same size and the same width and took pictures it took one it took a photograph of the Wallace wooden fake stomper and compared them all to the to the fake stomper and the difference was like night and day which would indicate that no Ray Wallace didn't make these footprints a five-year-old would have been fooled by that And of course, the Patterson Gimlin film. Supposedly, there's supposed to be evidence that Roger Patterson bought and modified a Bigfoot suit or gorilla suit. There's no evidence of that. There's no proof of that. We don't know if he did or not. I mean, we anybody can make claims. You know, Bob Hieronymus can make claims. The late Philip Morris made claims. Doesn't mean that they were right. Doesn't mean that they were credible. Minnesota Iceman? Well, that's a very interesting case. Was it a hoax? Two top scientists didn't think so. Ivan T. Sanderson and Bernard Hoegelmans. Now, both of them have passed on since, but... Could they have been fooled? Could they have been tricked by smell coming from inside the ice? and Inside the you know, crack in the ice and the glass? It's a good question. I talked to an individual who swears he saw the original Minnesota Iceman at a mall in New Jersey, I think it was, and said that the nose was bleeding. Which would be kind of strange for a frozen corpse, if you ask me. That seems kind of strange for a corpse to bleed from the nose a corpse frozen in ice. Of course, Hansen, Frank Hansen may have thawed it out, refroze it several times. Who knows? This is a photo of Hansen right here. This is Frank Hansen. Now, he's passed on, of course, so we can't ask him about it. But I would highly recommend reading the book if you can find a copy of it about the Minnesota Iceman, which was co-written by Bernard Hoevelmans and Igor, I mean, not Igor Bernstein, Boris Porzhnev, the, 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 English, the English, English translation version of it, which is, or was, available from Lauren Coleman's Cryptozoology Museum website. I don't think you can get a copy of it now. I think it's sold out. But it's a really good book. It really talks... It goes into quite a bit of detail about the Minnesota Iceman. I enjoyed that particular book myself. So is the Minnesota Iceman a hoax? That's a really good question. Ride of Bigfoot? Well, that has to be some kind of a hoax. That's got to be some kind of a hoax. Somebody claiming they've been abducted by a Bigfoot, but yet her clothes are clean and sp she smells of perfume. That sounds like a hoax to me. Bigfoot crosses Highway 1977. Now that was an admitted hoax. In fact, I remember at the Yakima Bigfoot Roundup 2014, Thomas Steenberg pointed out the man, Pat Lundquist. He pointed him out several times. He, he, he discussed Pat Lundquist, an individual who was part of, 
I, I believe it was either the bus driver or the witness. I can't remember which. Bigfoot captured in Pennsylvania. Well, I don't believe that. That's got to be a hoax. Oh, uh, the Georgia hoax. Yeah, that was definitely... That was definitely not real. We finally found out that was not real. Matter of fact, I just realized yesterday was the 15th anniversary. It was August, it, it was Friday, August 15th, 2008. When Tom Biscardi went on television and claimed that he had seen this thing and he had, he said he, what he touched, what he felt was not a mask, it was not a suit. Of course, that discredited Biscardi from then on, I think. You really want to be honest about it. Oh, Bigfoot run over. Okay, yeah. Randy, Randy Lee Tinley. That was a hoax as well. That's been nearly 11 years. That was in August of 2012. Wearing a ghillie suit. First person to ever be killed perpetuating a Bigfoot hoax. Very sad that it took that. It took the killing of someone. Like that. But I'm sure that hoaxes still go on. I'm not saying that they don't. Hopefully people are more careful. Because I guarantee if you run around in a, in a gorilla suit or a Bigfoot suit or a ghillie suit in hunting country, in gun country, you're risking getting your butt shot off. And Melba Ketchum's Sasquatch DNA Project. I suppose that could be considered a hoax as well. Or at the very least, just bad science. And finally, Rick Dyer came back and 2014 with Hank, this guy. Supposedly he killed an eight foot Sasquatch in Texas. He called it Hank. Of course, I, th I, I think I was a bunch of BS. This supposedly happened and was filmed in the movie Shooting Bigfoot. For that, I think. Of course, who was going to believe Rick Dyer after 2008? Who was going to believe him after that? I don't think anybody was going to believe him after that. You know, some people were taken in, some people were taken in, and I admit I was taken in at first by the Georgia hoax. But then when I realized what kind of BS it was, I became less credulous. Anyway, that's just a brief history of some Bigfoot hoaxes and what are supposedly Bigfoot hoaxes. Obviously, this website is more skeptical than most of all Bigfoot reports. Yeah, well, you can't please everybody. And that's going to do it for this week. I want to thank you very much for tuning in. You guys are the heart of the show.
I always say that, but I always mean it. And I will continue to do this as long as you guys want me to. And hey, until next week, y'all be good or be good at This has been HBM, Scripto Corner.